Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Scott Coover. I'm the president of the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association. Um, thanks for joining us for this D4 candidate forum. It's hosted by uh, the, the RNA, the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association, the Ravenna Bryant Community Association, and the Maple Leaf Community Council. Uh, thanks to Roosevelt High School for hosting us tonight, to all the candidates for joining us, and to all you neighbors for joining us and, and engaging in this process. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump right into this. We've got a lot of candidates, obviously, and a lot to get through. So uh, we'll jump right here into the, into the forum format. So we're going to start with each candidate is going to have 90 seconds for uh, an opening statement. After we get through that, we have a, um, questions that the, the community organizations have put together together um, to we'll ask each of the candidates those. So they'll have 60 seconds to answer those questions. Then we'll do a quick uh, lightning round, yes and no questions, yes and no answers to our questions. Every candidate has their yes and no cards in front of them. And then uh, closing statements, and that's, it's tight for time, so it's just gonna be just 45 seconds at the end to, to wrap up. Um, logistics, bathrooms are back there. Uh, louder. Bathrooms are back there, uh, men's and women's. Exits, there's, there's a bunch of ex exits in case of emergency, but back down that hallway and behind you and around the corner. Um, food and drink in the back if you'd like. Uh, I heard the, city democ the city's democracy voucher staff is going to be here. I don't know if they made it or not. Doesn't look like it. Uh, ground rules. We, since we have a lot of people to get through here and a lot of content, we're going to try and keep, uh, the pretty quiet, keep quiet between the answers. No clapping, no shouting, hooting, hollering. We'll, uh, and then to the candidates, obviously, we're going to keep it civil. We're here to hear about the policies and not, not your opinions of each other. <laughs> um, yeah, so we got a tight schedule here, so let's get underway. We've, set this, we've, we've randomly figured out the order here, um, and we're going to start with opening statements with Alex there on the end. We've got two uh, microphones that you guys will just pass down. Alex, when you're done with your 90 seconds, pass down this way. Okay. We have a, a um, timekeeper right here in the front who's got the, the, the cards to tell you when you've got 30 seconds left, 15, and when time's up. So go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. My name is Alex Peterson. I'm running to bring accountability to City Hall. I want to tell you a story about somebody I met today, doorbelling. Uh, her name's Elaine, and she lives on Brooklyn Avenue. And she just wants a city council member who's going to listen and who's going to be transparent about what's going on at City Hall. Where are the budget dollars going? What policies are coming? And to get better results, she's worried about homelessness. She's worried about the people who are suffering from homelessness, people who are camping in Ravenna Park and Cowan Park. And she wants to see better results from the city government. I'm the candidate with experience directly related to these priorities like homelessness. I worked at the Department of Housing and Urban Development during the Clinton administration literally in the office granting money to cities to reduce homelessness. I also worked for council member Tim Burgess, who is one of the most pragmatic and thorough council members that we have had in a long time. I want to bring that pragmatic approach back to city council. And I'm endorsed by, and this is why I'm endorsed by Nick Licata, Jerry Paulette, the 46th district Democrats. I share that endorsement with Kathy Tuttle. I'm endorsed by Eden Mack, Ruth Kagey, Peter Steinbrook. So I hope that I get your support too tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ethan Hunter. And uh, a few days ago, my sister told me a story about someone she was riding on the bus with. It was a homeless individual, and they had been talking. And he told her that for the last few weeks, uh, he had been trying to break the law so that he could get health care in prison because he wasn't able to get it um, in our city. And I thought, this is everything that's wrong with Seattle, and this is why I'm running. Uh, we have an obligation as a city to be compassionate uh, to everyone, regardless of whether or not they have a home. And it's up to us to provide the resources to help these individuals get the care they need. 
I believe that in Seattle, no one should go to sleep without a roof over their head. That means over a period of years, I want to invest more money into public housing, requiring developers to set aside units for affordable housing for low and mi low middle income families and the homeless. We have an obligation as a city to protect our environment for future generations. That means getting single occupancy vehicles off the road, expanding our public transportation, and expanding our network of bike lanes where necessary and needed. Uh, I'm running for city council to bring a, a fresh voice, new moral leadership to the council, and to be a voice for all of you. And I really appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name, it is loud. My name is Beth Mount Sear. Uh, I've been a resident of Ravenna for 20 years, and in fact, it feels very familiar to be back in Roosevelt High School. I have a daughter who went all the way through the local schools up here. Spent a lot of time volunteering in both Roosevelt and Bryant. I'm running because I felt like what the Seattle City Council is going to need in this next round is someone with experience. I've got 28 years of local government experience having worked on the executive side, starting out working on affordable housing, but also improving the design quality of what was being built in unincorporated King County. And then I moved to the council side where I was also focused on affordable housing, land use issues, and I come from a background of having a master's degree in architecture from UW and having worked on urban design and architecture projects for about 10 years. At this point, I work in Redmond and I've dove I'm diving into the weeds on transportation planning, doing a lot of work with Sound Transit and Metro. I think the focus of what we need to be doing throughout Seattle, but up here, is the same kind of smart climate change type things, focusing on safe and good transportation for our areas, but also, obviously, the need for housing. The homeless crisis that's in our community needs to be addressed. I think some of this, in terms of bringing new housing and more housing to our community, can be dealt with dealing with design quality. And I believe there should be a woman elected from D4. I'm Kathy Tuttle, and I also believe it's time to elect a woman from District 4. I've been listening to the community and going to your doors, knocking on your doors. And what I want to be is accountable also, but I want to be accountable to you. Uh, one of the first things that I want to do is make sure when I'm elected to have an in-district office, an in-district office and a staff member who can listen to your issues from District 4. I have a background working for the city. I worked for the city for a number of years as a planner and project manager for the Seattle Parks Department. I put in $40 million worth of uh, park and community center infrastructure during that time. I've also worked as a nonprofit executive director. I have a lot of very applicable skills for being the person to represent you in the city. I've lived here for 35 years. It's a city I love. It's a city you love, too. And let's keep it a city that we can love by talking together, meeting together, listening to each other. And uh, I'll tell you later about my endorsements, but there's some good ones. Thank you very much for coming tonight to listen to us. Hi, everyone. My name is Frank Kruger. I'm a small business owner, an engineer, and a renter down in Wallingford. This is my first time running for office. Seattle is a complicated place. On the one hand, we have a lot of wealth. On the other hand, we have nearly 6,000 people sleeping on the streets tonight. I'm running because I think the city has a duty to those people. I want to make sure that we have more open shelters. Anyone who seeks a bed at night should be able to go to those. Right now, we have a lot of people sleeping in their cars because they prefer that to shelters. I want to make sure that we have better hygiene in those shelters with enhanced shelters, and I want more hygiene facilities throughout the city itself. Right now, we only have seven 24-hour restrooms throughout the city. I want to make sure that we have more transitional housing. I really love tiny homes. I think that they are a great alternative to encampments. I myself would definitely prefer living in a tiny house over a tent, and I believe other people have too. But most importantly, I want to dramatically increase the number of social workers that we have. People need personalized care and attention to treat mental illness, drug addiction, and honestly, just to find jobs out there. I want to take a people-first approach to my policy, and I hope that you'll see that reflected in the rest of my answers tonight. 
If you'd like more elaboration or any questions from me, I'll be in the back at the end of all of this. Thank you very much. Hi, neighbors. My name is Sasha Anderson. So I was eight years old when I learned that poor people are terrible. It was all thanks to a couple of classmates I overheard saying that people who lived in trailers were trash. And I was hurt and confused because it didn't make any sense to me. I lived in a trailer with my family, but my mom is a nurse and dad a construction worker, and we worked hard for everything we had. Around the same time, I also realized I liked girls, not just because they were smart and funny, but I also found them attractive. And it didn't take me too long to realize that people didn't like gay people as much as they didn't like poor folks. And so I'm in third grade, getting to understand all of this, and I start to understand that people also don't like people of color, immigrants, and that was just the tip of the iceberg. And then I realized that other folks out there who were different like I was had most certainly overheard similar conversations. And I became angry and indignant. And I made a vow that I would always work hard to fight for people who were being left out and mistreated simply for who they were. And that's what I've done. I became the first member of my family to graduate from college, working my way through school to supplement grants and loans. To this day, I continue to work two and sometimes three jobs because I've dedicated myself to public service, working with the Peace Corps, Earthshare, and currently Big Brothers Big Sisters. That's what being on council means to me, working hard for all of us, and I hope to earn your vote. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Joshua Newman. I live here in Ravenna with my wife and our children. I've been a lifeguard, a preschool teacher, and for the last 13 years, a union engineer at Boeing. I've coached my kids' baseball teams, I've served on the board of my synagogue, and I've also been the past president of the Maple Leaf Community Council, as well as Seattle Subway, which is a transit advocacy group. Uh, I'm a policy wonk and I dig into the data, but when we get stuck talking about this rule or that street, we aren't talking about the big picture. And we're not talking about the uncertainty and fear a lot of people feel. A lot of change is coming to Seattle, and if we want to manage it well, we need leaders who can turn that uncertainty into opportunity. I know that we can do this together, but we're going to have to be brave. We can maintain and be true to our liberal values while letting some parts of Seattle evolve. Specifically, we need to make sure that people can get around without cars most of the time. We need to build more homes of more shapes and more sizes so people can find something that fits their needs and our most vulnerable neighbors don't end up on the streets. And finally, we need to build enough renewable energy in the next 10 years to completely replace what we use with fossil fuels right now. I know we can do this. We have to be bold. We have to plan for the 21st century and not look back to the 20th. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Sean Scott, um, formerly uh, editor of Real Change News. I think that the, the choice that's before us in this election cycle, not just for the District 4 race, but also citywide in uh, the seven council elections that we have up for grabs, is whether or not we want to move in the direction of being a compassionate city or one that enacts cruelty in our treatment to uh, those of us who are most vulnerable in the city. I think a compassionate city is one that has a fair and even tax code where um, vulnerable homeowners and uh, struggling renters and students are not treated as ATMs by repeated property tax levies because we don't have the political courage to tax those who have the most resources among us. I think a compassionate city is one that has ample social services, supportive housing, community service officers to support our houseless neighbors. Um, We've been endorsed in this race by uh, Carrie Moon, Jenny Durkin's uh, 2017 general election opponent, in part because of our commitment to making sure Seattle moves in the direction of becoming a more compassionate city. I think there are certain forces in the city um, that would like to see us be a more cruel city, that would like us to criminalize folks for being poor, that would like us to criminalize folks who have really no option but to sleep outside. Um, and so we have to do our part in District 4 to show the city and ultimately to show the world that that's not the kind of city that Seattle is. That when we go in the direction of compassionate policies, it turns out that not only do those make us feel better as a community, but they also work a whole lot better than some of the crueler solutions that I think folks, folks will advance. So look forward to a great discussion with the rest of the candidates tonight. 
Hi everybody, my name is Emily Myers. I am a scientist and Parkinson's disease researcher at the University of Washington, and I'm an executive board member with my union, UAW 4121, which represents about 6,000 academic student employees at the University of Washington. So our city right now is in a time of crisis. We are in a climate crisis, we are in an affordability of both housing and childcare crisis, and you know we are in a homelessness crisis. And we need leaders who are going to step up and use data and facts in order to inform the policies that we need in this city, not leaders who are going to you know, use this seat to try to further their political agenda. I'm a scientist and that is what I do. So when my PhD advisor told me that it was going to be hard to do the project studying Parkinson's disease that I did because the tools didn't exist, I made the tools. And when you know, we had a, 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 a professor at the university who was continuously harassing young women and they told me it was going to be hard to fight them. You know, I built a collaboration and I got people together in order to have that professor removed from taking action against young graduate students and young women. So the type of collaborative leadership that is evidence-based and facts-focused is the type of leadership I'll bring to the council, and that's why I've been endorsed by MLK Labor, you know, unions and workers, everyone from construction workers to nurses, uh, Tr council member Teresa Mosqueda, and others, so thank you. Whoops, I don't really have room. Hi, my name's Heidi Stuber, and I'm running because I believe in a better future for our city. I've lived in this city for 16 years. I've owned homes in both Wallingford and Ravenna, and this is the city where I raised my son. And I look around and think this is a beautiful, well-resourced city. People are moving here from all over the world, and I have to believe we can do a better job than this. I think we need a leader at City Council that can take action. We need to take action on the homelessness crisis while that is compassionate and gets more people into supportive housing. We need to take action on affordability by implementing thoughtful density that balances the needs of neighborhoods and newcomers. We need to take action on carbon emissions by making it easy and affordable to access public transportation. And we need to take action on closing the achievement gap and supporting our students and schools. I started my career as an environmental science teacher in Chicago. When I moved here, my teaching certificate didn't transfer and I fell into business. I've been a small business leader for a dozen years specializing in organizational change and I'm a single mom. And I'm running because I think city council needs to think about and pay attention to the needs of families, of small business owners, and of regular Seattleites just trying to make their mortgage every month. So I'm running to get things done, and even if you don't want to vote for me on August 6th, I would encourage you to vote for a woman on August 6th. There are five excellent choices up here. Thank you. Let's give all of them a quick round of applause for all that. Okay, so we're gonna move into the question uh, part here. Um, we've got five questions. We'll see how we're doing on time. We might go for six. Uh, everyone's gonna have 60 seconds to answer these questions. We're gonna start at this end with Heidi and work our way down that way. Um, as I work through the questions, I'll, uh, we'll, I'll tell you where we're starting. We're gonna, we're gonna mix up the order. Um, I'll organize it. And uh, let's see. If you need me to repeat the questions, please just let me know and I'm happy to do so. So, first question. Small local businesses are facing many challenges that have accompanied Seattle's recent growth, including rising rents, development pressures, construction impacts, and competition from large chains. What will you do to prevent commercial displacement for, lo for small local businesses? Heidi? It's 60 seconds for this round. Okay. So I love this question because I've been a small business leader since I was 23 years old. I got my first job running a local Sylvan Learning Center because I'm a former teacher in Bellevue and I immediately had over 30 employees and a budget of over $2 million. And I've consistently been a small business leader this entire time and I have seen in my current business in Fremont how we are stretched thin just like many households are stretched thin by rising rents, trying to pay our employees a living wage, and how hard it is to survive in this city. I think the first thing we need to do to support small businesses is elect a leader at City Hall that is business friendly and will listen and pay attention to this community and think about how we can protect them from displacement and keep this a vibrant city with many small and medium-sized businesses. 
So again, my name is Emily Myers. Um, you know, when we talk about when we talk about businesses in general in this city, we have to be very cautious of that. You know, we're not just grouping in big businesses with small businesses because a lot of the small businesses they don't have lobbyists that go to the city council that go to Olympia to speak for them. So it's really up to us as council members to go into those communities and talk to them about what their needs are. So what I've heard from small businesses is we're, they're scared of being displaced because of development. And I get that, that is a scary thing, you know, you, we can't have someone, you know, it's hard to have a, a business that's going to be moved or closed down for a year if your building is redeveloped. So we need to be looking at things like first right of refusal, meaning if a business is displaced, then it, it has the first chance to come back. And we need to be looking at the, the ways that developers are building the, um, the size of lots so that we can have smaller lots so that more smaller businesses can be in those lots and not just wait for large um, big box stores to be coming in so that they can make their mortgage. Sean Scott, um, I would like to see the city implement commercial rent control. Currently, we do not have the latitude to enact residential rent control. Um, that's something that we would have to ask Olympia for permission for. Commercial rent control is a different story. Um, I think that small business plays a very important role in the vitality and the lifeblood of a lot of our communities, and I see it every day in Eastlake. One of the things that we can also do to stimulate small businesses have cities and have a city, have a district that is very walkable, that's very um, accessible by bike, um, on foot, that's accessible via transit. Um, because, you know, when people are outside of their cars and getting around the city on foot, um, they're getting, you know, they're able to take in some of the, the great small businesses that we have in the district. I think we would also like to see the AV and the University District pedestrianized following the recommendations of the University of Washington Mobility Group. Um, and that's a real statement about um, something that we would be able to do as far as getting people out of their cars on the avenue and patronizing some of the small businesses that we have here in the district. Joshua Newman. Uh, you know, we love our small businesses and often we talk about business as one big monolithic group. And we need to recognize, just as Emily said, that there's a big difference between the international corporations that in many ways we are fortunate to have in the city, but the small businesses that really make up the heart of our communities, whether it's third place books in Ravenna, whether it's Grateful Bread in Wedgwood, or the variety of businesses that we all visit on the Ave. Um, we need to, uh, one of the main ideas that I'd like to see and that I'll be pushing for is a bank in Seattle. Seattle does have the right to charter that. And a bank in Seattle, a public bank, can provide low cost loans both to commercial uh, businesses as well as residents as well. We need to make sure that when buildings are built that the, that the commercial spaces inside are small enough that small businesses can afford that kind of rent. And finally, we need to improve the walkability and the densi density of all of our neighborhoods. Retail depends on walk-in traffic. Sasha Anderson. So I have a question for you all. How many of you all own a vacuum cleaner? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you all have ever been up to shambles up the street off of 15th? Awesome. So I bring up these two issues because it makes me think of what two small businesses, the vacuum cleaner shop just right off of Roosevelt and what shambles are experiencing. And it, and it lends to what Joshua was saying that businesses aren't a monolithic group our vacuum shop is worried about parking. They're afraid that they're gonna go out of business and they're already experiencing less sales because people can't access it. We need to address this. I'd like to see us work with a massage parlor next door so they can access parking there to make it easier for folks to drop off their vacuum cleaners to keep this small business going. Shambles is facing something because they are an unfinished masonry building, which is threatening to be demolished by the city right now. We need to talk with them to help them address this. I wish I could go on, but I'm at 60 seconds. Thank you so much. Hi, Frank Kruger. I've been running my business for 15 years now, and I have firsthand experience with displacement. I used to rent an office on the Ave itself, on University and 47th. It was the best office you could have in this town. But the rent went from $500 to $1,200 to $1,400, and that's when I had to call it quits and move my business to Freelard, of all places. 
But it's not just commercial businesses that run into this problem. We've seen a lot of social programs in the U District and around the city have to close their doors because they could no longer afford the rent either. To combat this, I want to take advantage of the upzoning that we're doing and require retail space, ground level retail space, to increase the amount of commercial space that we have throughout the city. As it's been mentioned, that increases the walkability of our cities and it's good for the environment and makes the city more livable. To that end, I want to make sure that when we're making decisions about roads, we take into account businesses and have loading zones. And I'll also agree with Sean Scott that we need rent control. Thank you. Kathy Tuttle. So one of the most important things we can do to have really good climate control in our area is dense, walkable neighborhoods. And that's true that we need to walk to our businesses, but our business owners also need to be able to be in walking distance or busing distance or biking distance of their businesses. Sock Monster is in my neighborhood in Wallingford. Its owner, uh, who has a young daughter, has to live in Montlake Terrace and commute to Sock Monster because she can't afford to live in the neighborhood, nor can any of her employees. It's a really difficult situation that we really need to resolve. We need to have dense housing, that wor workforce housing, that people can afford to live in so that our businesses, our business owners, and the people that patronize those businesses create very sustainable communities. Kathy Tuttle. Hi, Beth Mountseer again. Um, well, a number of the candidates have touched on things that I was thinking of that have been strategies that are used. Requiring new developments to have smaller retail spaces, not necessarily smaller lots, still means you can have your drugstore, but it only gets a certain amount of space along the street front and then is expanded in the back. But I think the other, the big thing that I also wanted to mention was it's really an attitude from the city council in terms of thinking about the ripple effect of the kind of policies that they pass and the impact that that has on small business owners. I believe we are in a transition period where they're, you know, we're moving towards much more walkable areas, but there's probably going to still be a demand for single occupancy vehicles and people running errands. There are ways for us to coordinate or require shared parking areas for multiple businesses. It's going to take um, some ingenuity, though, while we go through this transition um, before we move to all uh, walking, dense neighborhoods. Thanks. Ethan Hunter. I was talking to a gentleman in Wallingford while I was canvassing the other week, and what he told me, he's a small business owner, and what he told me is that he felt that his business was being unfairly taxed. Um, he has no problem with being taxed, but he says it's ridiculous that uh, a small business like his is being taxed more than Amazon, and I absolutely agreed with him. And I think it's time that Seattle looks at uh, our tax code in, in terms of what we tax businesses and take a hard look at how is this affecting our city and our small businesses? I think it's ridiculous that small businesses in Seattle throughout our district are paying more in taxes than the largest corporation in the world. I agree with Sean, I would like to see the AV turn into a pedestrian only walkway with, how, with the amount of uh, small and immigrant owned businesses um, along the AV. I think it's really important that we get more and more foot traffic on there, support the small businesses along the AV uh, in, throughout our district and city. Alex Peterson, thanks for the question. So the city government has a Department of Economic Development, and it's really important that we make better use of that department. We just, uh, the mayor just appointed a new director who came from Portland, who is very knowledgeable about how to retain businesses, because right now, the Seattle Department of Transportation just tears up the road, and there's, there's no mitigation for the businesses. Um, the owner of Hardwick's Hardware, uh, is, has endorsed me because I understand that those property taxes that, that are raised are passed straight through to businesses on their triple net leases and, it's, and they can't just raise the prices of their goods and services. So, so harnessing the power of our Department of Economic Development, supporting neighborhood chambers of commerce. The, the businesses need to organize. There's a new North Seattle Chamber of Commerce that just started up. We need to support organizations like that. And also the AV, we need to remove the AV from the up zone because the up zone there is very disruptive. Thank you. 
Thank you all. Quick round of applause for those answers. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are doing a great job sticking to the time limit. We're, we're doing really well on time here, so thank you. Uh, we're going to start this next question with Ethan and work down this way, just to switch up the order. So number two here. Um, in 2021, the Roosevelt and Brooklyn light rail stations will open. Both are within a mile, of many, mile radius of many uh, D4 residents, yet not everyone can have light rail at their doorstep. If elected, what will you do to equitably improve tr connections between homes, workplaces, and transit and ensure access to public transit? Ethan. Um, so to start, what we need to be doing is ensuring that the first mile of everyone's trip, uh, getting to light rail, and then the last mile, um, we have uh, connected buses, um, ride shares, being able to set up for people to get to those areas. Uh, I also want to see, and one of my proposals is that we provide uh, free ORCA cards to uh, low and middle co income individuals um, in our city and to every student at Seattle Public Schools. Um, transportation, uh, neighborhood density is one of the key points in my campaign, and I think that it's really uh, it's great that we have these uh, new light rail stations coming to our district and city, but we need to be making sure that we upzone uh, near these major transportation hubs to ensure that when people are moving into our city, that they're doing so near public transportation, being incentivized to use that public transportation, getting their cars off the road, uh, and then again, as I mentioned earlier in my opening statement, getting people onto public transportation, bikes, or walking to their destination um, will reduce carbon emissions in our city as we get more and more single occupancy vehicles off the road. Great. Well, I think one of the things that's actually already underway is Metro is working with SDOT and starting to do the planning. And in fact, I, they're scheduled to come out and start talking to the neighborhoods in this area where the new light rail stations will be opening in 2021. So as touched on, it's key to make sure that we have the right kind of connections to get to light rail, but that's not just fixed bus routes. Um, it's also sidewalks, it's bike lanes, it's other alternative pieces of transportation and getting that right mix of potentially the shareable bikes and scooters and those sorts of things, but with the right kind of regulation so that all of us feel safe as we're trying to get to the light rail. It also means though planning ahead for not everyone is getting to light rail and thinking about the long-term connections between other areas, employment centers. It's not everyone heading towards downtown, it's people heading over towards Bellevue and the east side and jobs there. So all that planning needs to happen. Thank you. Kathy Tuttle, this is an area that I have some expertise in. I ran an organization called Seattle Neighborhood Greenways for a number of years. Uh, and one of the projects that we worked on was safe routes to transit. It's difficult that last mile. And the best way, of course, to get to transit is through other transit, taking a bus there or walking there. People already have the experience in this neighborhood of the difficulty of getting to the university station. It's a long, long walk, and the buses don't serve it very well either. We really need to get this right. We need to make sure that the bus connections are good, that we have shuttle buses if necessary, that we're not stripping out buses, bus service in order to serve the light rail. That's what we've done already. We're taking away some bus service. We need to put that bus service back. We need to have enough par parking for uh, bikes and we need to have very safe pedestrian connections to those, those new light rail stations. They're not gonna work unless we do. Kathy Tuttle. Hi, Frank Kruger. In District 4, we're very lucky to have these three light rail stations, but I always joke that we have three of them, but I live a mile and a half from all of them. And I've heard that same thing repeated throughout District 4. We need to definitely work on the buses. Specifically, we need to work on the east-west directions of these buses. In the future, I hope that we'll have a light rail station in Ballard, but right now, getting from District 4 over to Ballard, as we all know, is quite a pain. Everyone voted on Move Seattle. We were promised an improvement to our infrastructure, more buses, more bike lanes. We deserve that. We voted for it, we want it. We come up with excuses for this reason or that reason why we don't complete it. But I wanna tell you right here that that will be my priority and not half measures either, not the zigzagging that we do through downtown because we've made compromises here and there, but safe bike lanes. You should be able to get from Roosevelt to downtown without risking your life. Thank you. Oh, thank you. 
I'm of the firm belief that if we make it as easy as possible to get from point A to point B via public transport, that people will do that. What I'd like to see is a congestion tax being implemented downtown so that we can take what Ethan mentioned one step further and not just have free ORCA cards for students or low income folks, but that public transit in Seattle can be free. If I know I can get from here to downtown and it's not gonna cost me anything, why would I choose to sit in gridlock traffic and then pay $20 for parking? We're smart folks, we're on top of our finances, it just makes fiscal sense. I would also like to see what Frank mentioned, more east to west focus, first and last mile solutions. One thing that my neighbors brought up, I just live a block away, is the crosswalk that many of you probably took to get over here. It needs to be a lit up crosswalk. That's in the works. We need to focus more on that so it's easier for people to get where they want to go safely. Joshua Newman. Uh, I had the honor of being at the ceremonial groundbreaking for the Northgate extension. And I was there with Dave Frock and Mayor McGinn at the time as part of both my leadership in the Maple Leaf Community Council as well as Seattle Subway. So I've been working on mass transit for a long time and we're going to need to expand it. So in order to make sure that people have equitable access to it, first off we need to have incredible bus transfers. And that part of that's going to take is it's going to take removing arterial street parking and enabling people and making it easier for most people to get around without a car. Most people, not everyone. I've got four kids. I'm not taking them on the bus every day. Um, but when more people are out of their cars, it does create more opportunity for us all to get around. We also need incredible bike and pedestrian construction. The solution here on 65th, as everyone's seen, is too many compromises, um, and we need to expand the density nearby. So with respect to uh, last mile solutions and how we're going to get people from uh, our homes to light rail, um, I'm the son of Jamaican immigrants. My parents and my grandparents actually moved to New York City in the 1970s, which for anybody who knows anything about urban history was a hell of a time to be in New York. Um, my grandfather, Jimmy, who passed away last year, was actually an entrepreneur who helped pioneer what was known as the dollar van service. Um, so these were communities within Queens that were sort of cut off from major transit hubs throughout the city. He saw that there was a need for a last mile solution. I'm not sure that that's how he would have termed it, um, but actually devised a shuttle service. So he went from neighborhood to neighborhood, um, driving people to major transit hubs elsewhere in Queens. I would like to see a similar uh, solution enacted here in Seattle, preferably obviously with an electric vehicle. Um, with respect to where this fits into our, our clim larger climate strategy, so far three environmental organizations have endorsed in this race. The Sierra Club is a sole endorsement that I enjoy. Seattle Subway, an endorsement that I enjoy with uh, Joshua Newman, um, and also the Transit Writers Union I found out today has co-endorsed Emily Myers and I. Yeah, thank you. I'm Emily Myers. Um, so yeah, we did both share that endorsement, which was really exciting. Um, but I think, you know, when it comes to something like this first mile, last mile solutions, all of these ideas are going to be great ideas. And you know, the, the shuttle service is something that I know the city is talking about piloting right now. And I think that is something that we could be using, especially in this area where we have very few east west bus routes. I think one of the biggest things that we need to make sure that we're doing is taking data into consideration. So looking at the line bike data of like where people are using their bikes and build infrastructure with data-driven bike lanes so that we know where they should be going and then constantly reevaluating right like if, if the bus lanes aren't working and the bike lanes are like come into the neighborhoods talk to folks about it make sure that you all are getting the access you need to the light rail stations and that's something like as a scientist who is constantly reevaluating my work that's something that I'm going to do in City Council is making sure that you know it's not just one plan that we're continuing to engage folks and, and reevaluate our plans Heidi Stuber, it's great to go last because everybody says so many great things, uh, second to last. Um, so I agree with so many things people have said. I agree that we need to add the neighborhood bus routes back that have been cut. I agree that we need to think really thoughtfully about bus to light rail connections and also pedestrian safety getting to those. I personally take the light rail and I take the 372 and have to walk all the way across. It doesn't make sense for people pushing strollers. It doesn't make sense for people who are mobility impaired. 
So we have a great opportunity with the new stations going in to do a better job. I'd also like to see us raise the limits of the ORCA lift card, which is the reduced cost ORCA pass, so it covers middle class people as well. To do all these things, we're going to have to elect somebody that under has good grasp of financial leadership and can make good use of our Move Seattle levy and put it to the projects that will impact the most people. So we're really blessed to have the two light rail stations opening up. But those people who try to use the Husky station, you know, the access to that was really messed up. And if you've ever tried to walk from U Village to Husky Stadium or from other neighborhoods there, it's you know, we need to do a much better job improving the pedestrian pathways to Husky Stadium. What I'd like to do with the three stations here is run a series of pilot projects, measure the data, see what's working best to move the most people to the light rail stations, and then replicate that for the rest of the area. So it could be subsidizing shuttle vans, it could be um, the pedestrian pathways, it could be cycling, it could be a number of things, but we need to measure the data and then replicate what works best. Thanks. Great, thank you everybody. Uh, question number three, we're going to start with uh, Emily here and work down that way. So elected officials often need to make tough policy decisions that are unpopular with their constitu constituents because their experience, knowledge, and counsel from experts tells them it is the right thing to do. What is one policy issue that you would support even if your D4 constituents do not favor it? Emily? Yeah, okay, I'm going to stand for this one. <laughs> Um, so this is a really great question and I want everyone to sit with an open mind. Um, so I'm going to say the, the policy that I would support are safe consumption sites. I am a neuroscientist. I am very aware of how drug addiction and substance abuse disorders work. My policy manager is an opioid researcher. So we're very knowledgeable about this. Safe consumption sites save lives. They are a harm reduction strategy that helps control um, infectious diseases, that helps people have access to social workers and access to resources, and um, in case there's an overdose, then people have access to medical care immediately. It takes the burden off emergency services. It also does, the, the data shows us that it does not increase crime in neighborhood, it does not increase um, you know, problematic behavior. What it does do is it keeps our, our people safe and it keeps the people who are going to be using drugs anyways safe. So I would have to say that the uh, policy that I have found to be one of the more contentious ones in talking with uh, my District 4 neighbors is the idea of ending the um, current city policy of sweeping homeless encampments. I think at this stage, the city has wasted $10 million a year going back to, I think it's 2013 or 14, um, on the sweeps of homeless encampments with, which have not been shown to um, reduce either the amount of houseless folks in the district or in the city um, or to curb um, rates of drug usage, mental health episodes that houseless folks might be suffering through. So I think that um, from a fiscal accountability lens, I know that that's a um, popular buzzword in this race. It's also the case that looking back, I would rather have that $60 million a year, I'm um, going back to 2013 or 14, spent on supportive housing, spent on mental health services, perhaps uh, spent on a, a consumption site, um, and that having those piecemeal solutions which are moving us in the direction of being a more compassionate city as opposed to a cruel one would actually be a more effective city policy for us. Josh Miniman. Cars are not our future. Cars are an amazing technology and we designed our cities and our country and every new city in the United States for the last 80 years around using a car. But they're not our future. We know that from climate change. We know that for congestion. Even if all the cars were electric, you still get traffic jams. You still can't get around. And they're still heavy and dangerous. And they still take up a lot of space that we could use as parks, as offices, as retail space. So the policy that I will advocate for is removing arterial street parking throughout the city. We know that retail and commercial places depend on foot traffic and walk-in traffic. That's why commercial places like the U District are more expensive than ones up near Northgate and out in the suburbs. 
We need to prioritize pedestrian access to our commercial areas <laughs> and the walkability, not our cars. Sasha Anderson. This is a tough question, but it's such an important one because there are always gonna be things that we disagree on. I'm the kind of person that will sit with anyone in here, any opinion. For instance, half of my family and extended family voted for Trump, but we're all still on speaking terms. So one issue that I would move forward on without the full support of District 4 constituents is pairing a community police outpost with an urban rest stop. A lot of the folks that I talk to at the doors are either very supportive of police and have concerns about our homeless neighbors or very supportive of our homeless neighbors and have concerns about our police. Pairing these two together where you can have a police presence and also an area where our homeless neighbors are able to take a shower, brush their teeth, use the restroom, and also a place where I would like to have a district office and be available to constituents brings it all together and that's what community building is. Hello, Frank Kruger. Controversy. <laughs> when I go around, I think the first one that I was introduced to was the upzoning controversy. Everyone had opinions on MHA and how the city is changing. I understand this. I myself had a large apartment complex built next to me. I used to have a beautiful view of Lake Union and Gasworks Park, and it's gone now. But we have to acknowledge that the city is growing. Just this week, Apple announced that it's hiring 2,000 new people. Facebook is hiring, Google is hiring, I wanna leave someone off. Tableau just got bought by Salesforce. That's gonna be more jobs. We need to acknowledge that the city is growing and not stick our heads in the sand. I'm excited by the idea of opening our neighborhoods to people who otherwise couldn't afford them before by stabilizing rent prices. In fact, I'm inspired by a crazy idea, but I love it, of eliminating single family zoning altogether. Let's open up the city, let's build, let's open our neighborhoods to new people and make it affordable. Thank you. Kathy Total. The biggest reason that I got into this race is that since the early 90s, I've been working on climate action and I feel a call to actually do something about climate action. I have felt since the early 90s to do something, but now we really have to. We have five years to turn the whole ship of state around. The city has to change radically. So that's going to be controversial. We need to have density. We need to have really good bus transportation. We need to lower our carbon footprint in half in the next 10 years, maybe even more. And when you start to, you know, you're the wheels start to go and you start to think about what some of those things are that we're going to have to change, those are gonna be some pretty controversial things. We're going to have to travel a little less and walk a little more and live a little more densely than we do. Actually, a lot more densely and walk a lot more too. So. Go with me on this journey because we don't have a choice. We really do need to change how, what our footprint is. Beth Mountseer. Yeah, I think the elephant in the room and the one that's really right in our backyard is this, how our communities are changing. And I, I think all of us have acknowledged change is hard and there's a lot of change coming to the city. Um, I have to say I'm a bit more of an incrementalist than some people. I don't think this has to happen overnight, although I completely agree with Kathy that, and thinking about Frank's comments of the future of less impact in terms of carbon and those sorts of things, that we do need more density. We can do it, I think, in ways that preserve the quality of life in our neighborhoods. And part of that is getting the design guidance right, getting the incentives right to include affordable housing in that new development that's happening. Um, it's not a matter, one of the things I think some neighbors would disagree with is just the approach to how you permit projects. In this case, we're adding process that just adds cost and doesn't add value. I believe that uh, every decision a council member makes will, be co will come under large amounts of scrutiny, and for good reason. Uh, 
we need to have a difficult uh, but necessary conversation regarding uh, our environment and the future of our planet. Um, one of the things that I want to see in Seattle is uh, for us to implement uh, congestion pricing, uh, specifically to start with on single occupancy vehicles. I've talked to people throughout the district, some of them are supportive of it, a lot of them don't however, but it's absolutely necessary that we make harsh decisions, tough decisions, to get people out of their cars, onto buses, onto bikes, or to walk where they need to go. At the same time, while we do that, we need to make sure that we're expanding our network of bike lanes, expanding on public transportation, so that people aren't just get, being taxed with no, on their cars with no other options. We need to give them the options and then still tax the vehicles that uh, continue to go through our city. Alex Peterson, I think it's really important when a council member is making decisions to listen to all sides, to be transparent about his or her decision making, and to explain the pros and cons of the decision, not to just be a cheerleader for it. So one of the things I think will be controversial is I, I really believe we should be funding only those homeless response programs proven to work. So that means that some programs that don't produce outcomes, that don't actually exit people to permanent supportive housing, We'll need to redirect funds from those nonprofits to nonprofits that are actually doing really well and actually helping people, helping to house people. And I think that'll be controversial for people who volunteer with those nonprofits, serve on the boards of those nonprofits, or just know about those, those organizations. But I think as long as the council member explains him or herself and is transparent about decisions, then that's the way to go. So I'm a big believer, Heidi Stuber, that the right answer is often lies between two extremes. I really do, I'm a pragmatist as a business leader doing strategic change. I often think about the pragmatic middle ground approach. And I think one of the most controversial issues in our district is density. And it's actually the one where my thinking has evolved the most in the course of that campaign. As a single, home, single family home owner with a special needs child and a dog, single family neighborhoods make sense to me. But the more I learned about the impact of climate change, the more I learned about how many jobs had been added in our city and how not enough houses had been added, I became convinced that we needed a thoughtful and balanced solution for density. And so I completely support the ADU legislation that's currently in front of City Council, even though some of my neighbors don't, because I think it is a balanced and thoughtful way to add density in our single family neighborhoods without changing them over completely. Thanks everybody, that was a tough question. Well, easier one this time around. Um, <laughs> So if elected, what would your top three 2020 budget priorities be and why? How do those priorities benefit D4 constituents? We'll start with, uh, let's start with Beth and work down this way. This is, you may have gathered some of us got, or all of us got a little bit of advance warning on just a couple questions and had some time to think about this. In that subset of um, homeless and human services funding, and I know it's another one that I thought about mentioning as being a controversy and divided opinions, but especially people, especially people who are homeless but have managed to retain their cars are the people who are most likely to be able to move back into permanent housing. They typically have jobs and so on. One of the areas that I noticed in last year's budget that they still are not funding all that well is assistance to that population. The other top three po uh, priorities for me would be looking at more of this sort of incentives and things that would make more affordable housing be a component of privately developed housing, which really is the engine that brings the most. So more incentives like tra uh, transfer of development rights and other sorts of um, things in that way. And then finally on transit, I would also say that some of the smartest investments that we could make, and I didn't see a high priority, is signalization and making sure that we can move buses and those HOV vehicles quickly. Kathy Tuttle, last week I knocked on the door of a family that lived uh, or lives across the street from the Metropolitan Market uh, in a condo. Uh, two working parents, there was a uh, a uh, woman who worked uh, as a gymnastic teacher and a man who works as an elementary school teacher in a local school. 
and they have two young children. They paid $2,500 a month in childcare, and she was in tears when I, I walked to the door because they were boxing up all of their things. They were going to have to sell their condo because they can't afford to live and pay for childcare in the community that they love. And so, yes, the things that I want to work on are workforce housing, uh, childcare that's affordable, and we need to keep people in their homes. I mean, we really do need to keep people in their homes because we can't build communities, we can't build communities in the future if we don't keep people in the homes that they love, that they should be able to afford, and two working class salaries. Hi, <clears throat> Frank Kruger again. You can't talk about the budget without first talking about revenue. We are in a dire situation where our revenue is very regressive. That means the lower income people are paying more than their majorities, than their shares worth. I believe in a state income tax and I wanna push Washington to have one, but that's gonna take time. In the short term, I wanna have thoughtfully crafted taxes on large businesses. Yes, a head tax, I am pro head tax. But, but before then, I want to have partnerships with businesses so that they can be a part of our communities and not just take advantage of it. Number two, I want to make sure that funds go to their intended purposes. What we tell people the money is going to go to, it should. The red light violations should go to infrastructure and for building new school sidewalks. Lastly, I want to ask that every department in the city take a small cut across the entire board so that we can reallocate funds to the human services departments. I said that I want to dramatically increase the number of social workers, and I mean it. Thank you. Sasha Anderson. My top three budget priorities would be human services, education, and neighborhoods. I have another question for you all. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard the terms affordable housing crisis or homelessness crisis. I, I thought so. So when I was looking at the 2020 budget that was coming out of the mayor's office, the two budget line items that address these issues out of seven budget buckets were items five and six. We know we're in a crisis with homelessness and affordable housing. Why are we not funding it? This is a major issue that I saw and why I would devote funds to that. And the fact that every single person in this room raised their hands is why it's so important to District 4. Thank you. Joshua Newman. Uh, top three budget priorities are addressing homelessness. We need to have some quick fixes and provide people places to live. We need to improve, second, we need to improve permitting and expand our city's ability to build the homes that we need. And third, as I was talking about before, we need bus lanes. And I'll do this with actual transparency. I mentioned I'm an engineer, I believe in data, and I believe in an analytical process. And so I actually have to take issue with one of the other candidates up here who talks about transparency and talks about accountability, but isn't clear who he's gonna be accountable to. Alex says he talks about accountability, but... not to have people on there, I'll work on that. There is no, there's limited policy information on his website. You deleted your newsletter subscription. And when it talks, and when we're talking about being accountable to the people, we know who the accountability is gonna be. We're in this mess because previous city council members were on the council and allowed the housing crisis to come up. It's a uh, tough act to follow. Um, I think that, you know, as somebody who used to work as a youth mentor for Washington Middle School with the My Brother's Keeper Initiative, which was a program started by President Obama in 2015 and funded currently by the Parks and Recreation Program, I would like to see the money that we're using um, currently on ineffective sweeps of homeless encampments to actually be directed to youth programs and mentorship programs like My Brother's Keeper and My Sister's Keeper. Secondarily, I would like to see uh, the city's community service officer program expanded. Currently, we have 12 CSO officers that were recently uh, reinstated into the budget. Those are unarmed officers that are gonna be responsible for going to homeless encampments, to people who might be suffering mental health uh, episodes, um, and directing those people to services. And the district where 
where Charlena Lyles was killed, I think a CSO program would have saved a life. Thirdly, while we're talking about climate justice and as a candidate that's been endorsed by the Sierra Club, I would like to see us dip into our debting capacity to pay for the housing we need, to pay for the transit we need, because I'd rather be paying off debts in 20 or 30 years than not having a planet to live on in 10 or 15. Yeah, I'm, I'm Emily Myers. Um, so I believe that budgets, budgets are moral documents. And so I think if we're serious about addressing climate change, we need all of our um, policy decisions to be centered around climate justice. So one of the first things we would do is um, streamline the Office of Housing so that we can build more mixed um, supportive housing with mixed income housing, with green spaces and proximity to transit, and have more housing options for the people of Seattle. I also would also like to see the budget that's being used for weatherization to be moved to the Office of Sustainability and Transport and Environment so that we can do weatherization programs because building are our second largest carbon emitters in our city and we need programs and incentives to um, retrofit our buildings and create green jobs that way with apprenticeships with unions. And third um, is transportation to make sure that we're not using a car-centric model for transportation because we know that when people spend less time in traffic they're happier and they can walk around and, and take transit to do their daily activities. I agree wholeheartedly with Emily that budgets are moral documents. I've been writing multi-million dollar budgets for basically my whole career. And while one part of the budget is looking at the revenue, the other side of the budget is looking at the expenses. Over the last several years, King County has done performance audits and cut over $100 million out of their budget. City of Seattle needs to do the same, and here's why. My, that's my first budget priority, and it's order to fund the next two, which is Health and Human Services and Office of Housing, which together comprise less than 10% of our city budget. We know we have a homelessness crisis. I want to see more people in support of housing with the wraparound services they need. And in order to do that, I think we need to take a hard look at where we're spending our money and where there are opportunities to improve and redirect funds to the most effective programs that are getting people off the streets and into the shelter where they can get the treatment they need. Alex Peterson. So I used to work for Tim Burgess, who chaired the city's budget committee. I was his legislative aide during three budget seasons. And what's remarkable is what's happened to the budget since then. It's gone from $4 billion to $6 billion. It's gone up about a third, but the administrative piece of the pie has gone up 64%. So I agree with Heidi that we need to take a, a look at that budget with the city auditor find savings to then prioritize other things. Homelessness is the main priority. So we need to reduce homelessness. We need to fund those best practices proven to reduce homelessness. The other priority is community policing. I agree with Sean that we need to expand the community service officer program. They need to be going into neighborhoods and making more contact with communities and also engaging more with the homeless population to help them get to housing and services. Thank you. Uh, so to start, uh, I, wanted to also, I also would like to see more community policing in Seattle. And I believe that in our next budget uh, and in going forward that we need to be investing more money into our police and into our firefighters, our first responders. I think it's absolutely crucial that if we want to have community policing, that police be able to live in the communities that they serve. And if they're not making a salary where they can afford to live in these expensive areas throughout our city, uh, we're not going to have this community policing where uh, neighbors and police uh, are you know, friends and not just seeing each other uh, when someone breaks the law. The second thing, I would like to see more money invested into childcare. I believe that uh, when someone gives birth, uh, they should be able to spend time with their child. Uh, so that also leads into uh, paid family and medical leave. I believe we should start a pilot program centered around that. And then we need to be investing as much of our money uh, into education, supporting our students, supporting our teachers, giving them the resources that they need. Uh, to succeed. Uh, I want to allocate uh, parts of the budget that aren't working, and then we also need to look at new taxes to raise the revenue. Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, question number five, and we will start with uh, Sean and work our way down that way. Number five, uh, recognizing the complexity and interrelated nature of issues that Seattle is currently facing, what will you do to address the intersection of housing affordability, substance misuse, and criminal justice? 
Well, I've already, and thank you for the question, I've uh, spoken already about um, my stance on ending uh, sweeps of the homeless in the city. I think that uh, supportive housing is a direction that we need to go in as somebody who used to be uh, the editor of Real Change News and seeing the houselessness crisis up close every day, how happy a lot of our vendors were to be able to get inside for the day. Um, is an, an approach that we should further institutionalize with city policy that actually backs up our commitment to providing housing with the funds that need that with the funds that that necessitates. I also think it's the case that um, our police department and our fire department are able to use opiates to treat um, folks who are coming down from uh, opiate withdrawals, and the argument against consumption sites is often that it will encourage uh, further encourage lawless activity. And I think the police department would actually disagree. They would tell you that being able to use Naxalone has been um, a real boon to helping to stem uh, opiate abuse where it intersects with uh, the house census crisis. So I would like to see um, consumption sites somewhere north of the Ship Canal in the city of Seattle as well. Josh Newman. So we've talked a little bit about housing affordability. And the fact is, is that when people are living in the parks, when people are living under bridges, they're not living there by choice. Yeah, a small amount of them are. Most of them are there because they have nowhere else to go, because they have lost their homes, because they couldn't make rent, or because they had a fight with their roommate. So we have to expand the number of houses, and we have to grow denser as a city. That means addressing and adding density in the single family homes. It means giving people who are struggling with a drug addiction permanent supportive housing. People cannot fight that on their own and they certainly cannot fight that when they're struggling to find their next meal or when they're struggling to stay dry in the rain. Housing first policies are proven to work because people, all of us need including everyone in this room, all of us need sometimes a quiet place to just gather our thoughts. And if we can't do that, then addressing things with the harsh arm of our criminal justice system is bound to continue failing. Scott, can you repeat the question? Sure. So, recognizing the complexity and interrelated nature of issues that Seattle is currently facing, what will you do to address the intersection of housing affordability, substance misuse, and criminal justice? I wish I could know everything so I could address all these problems, especially in the 60 seconds I have. <laughs> but since I can't, the very first thing I would do is sit down with the experts in these fields to understand what's already being done so that as a city, Seattle, as a city of Seattle council member, I'm not recreating the wheel. This means sitting down with the Public Defenders Association, with our homeless community members who are living in tents and in housing and in transitional shelters to understand what's already working best for them. I would like to see, and one of the reasons why I brought up an investment in human services is more of a focus on programs like LEAD that we know are working. That's the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program that approaches folks who are low-level drug users or engaged in prostitution to offer them a way out of that. We need to work with more folks like this and, and engage more with LEAD, and that's, that's one of the first things that I would do. Thank you. Hi again, Frank Kruger. Substance abuse. We've heard a lot about how homeless people are addicted, but let me tell you about a statistic. Here in Washington, we lead the country in a certain kind of drug abuse, and you might think it's heroin, you might think it's marijuana, we certainly are up there for that, but it's painkiller addiction. We have people that are addicted to drugs, and very harsh drugs, long before they become homeless. You don't become homeless and then immediately get addicted to heroin from the magic heroin fairy. It takes time to build up that addiction, and it takes time to cure someone of that addiction. That's why I want to reinforce the idea that I, we need more social workers throughout this city. We need people to guide others through the myriad of social programs this city has to offer. There's so many that it's hard to keep track of. Lastly, I want to re remind you of the tiny houses that I'm just such a big fan of. We've seen good community building. People are given responsibilities for security, and they gain a sense of purpose. Sorry, my time's up. Thank you very much. Kathy Tuttle. 
One of the things that I've actually appreciated about running for office is that I've had a chance to research a lot more about homelessness. And I've gone around and talked to leaders at Plymouth Housing, Bellwether, Mercy, Salvation Army, Catholic Community Services, DESC. I was at Salvation Army last week uh, and went into a place where 191 men live in transitional housing. And it was eye-opening. These are people who are in what's called low barrier housing. And uh, again, it's a three-story building that holds 191 men. And they have four washing machines, imagine that, uh, four dryers, and not very many things other than that, bunk beds, lockers, and it's low barrier, but it gives people a chance to get off the street and transition to housing. We need a lot more of this. We need a lot more different kinds of housing for all of our neighbors, uh, including transitional housing. Beth Mountseer. Well, I think we've covered some of the um, real challenges of not having enough housing. And in fact, one of the conversations I've had with people and neighbors is, you know, the fact that we used to have single room occupancy hotels until we didn't have them anymore and they provided a way for people who had intermittent work or other substance abuse or alcohol problems. That's something that we might want to bring back as a model of um, another sort of low barrier kind of housing that could provide help for people. But I wanted to talk about that intersection though also of substance abuse and law enforcement. I'd also noted that the lead, the um, uh, law enforcement um, and diversion programs can get people into treatment and offer them that versus going to jail. But I think the other elephant in the room, and some of you may have read, is also just the issue of the civil commitment laws in the state and the inability of both the courts and people trying to assist folks with substance abuse. So we may need a change in those policies as well. Well, with time being limited, I really want to focus on substance abuse. Uh, I have a cousin in my family who's currently uh, addicted to heroin. He's been addicted to heroin for the last few years. He's been in and out of rehab treatment, uh, rehab facilities um, throughout the country. And I think it's really important that Seattle going forward uh, does its part in uh, protecting and helping these individuals get the care that they need. Uh, we talked in the last question about the, the budget. That means we, we also need to be spending more money to help these individuals get that care, more money into mental health care services. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but a few uh, months ago there was an article on CNN that talked about the three phases of the opioid crisis. Phase one was uh, drug companies putting these uh, pain money, lobbying money, to get these prescription opioids handed out in the doctor's office. Phase two was people getting addicted to heroin. We're now in phase three where fentanyl, the size of a grain of salt, can literally kill someone in seconds. It's time that we take drastic action on this issue, and I hope to be a leader on this issue in City Council. Alex Peterson, on a housing affordability, so I worked at the Department of Housing and Urban Development and worked on affordable housing for 15 years in the private sector as well, building affordable housing, refinancing it. We need to do more to prevent evictions. We need to go upstream to prevent people from becoming homeless to begin with. Substance abuse issues, we need to work better with King County. Our mayor is trying to work better with King County, but the current city council is a complete distraction on this issue because King County, that's where the mental health and drug dependency dollars flow through the county, and they have some good programs. We need to coordinate better with King County so we can get people the help they need. In terms of the criminal justice system, there there is a subpopulation of people who are committing crimes and we need to do a better job addressing that. There was a report that came out of people committing crime after crime after crime, and they're not being getting the help they need, and we need to look into that. City Council has the power to do that. Thank you. As so many council members or future up here have said this is such a tough issue right and we know that there's comorbidity by which I mean there's people who are struggling with substance use who are also struggling with mental health issues and it's no secret the evidence is clear housing first solutions work 
I will say, as someone like Ethan, who has somebody very dear to me that is currently a substance, struggling with substance use and homeless on the peninsula, my best friend from high school, I am a big believer that what is happening in our parks is not a safe and sustainable solution for people like my friend. We have to first create more shelter. That has to happen first. We need somewhere safe for these people to go where they can address their issues. We have to do that first, and then we have to reestablish our expectations for clean and safe public spaces so that people are in shelter where they can get the treatment they need and that the community as a whole is safe. As a mom who knows many people who have had kids in, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm Emily Myers. One of the things that I haven't heard anyone talk about yet on this issue, the, and really is the intersection of you know, ha affordable housing and substance abuse and criminal justice, is the fact that when I sat down with frontline workers, they're telling me that we now are having an epidemic of methamphetamine use in our city because people who are living unsheltered are afraid to sleep at night because they are afraid to be they're afraid of being assaulted or robbed or having some other crime committed against them. And let me tell you, as someone who studies the brain, if you can't sleep, you are gonna have a hard time getting anything else done. So we need housing first policies to get people inside so we can help them with whatever else is happening, whether it's a substance abuse disorder or mental health. We need affordable housing, we need wraparound services and housing first policies because we should not be having to rely on methamphetamines so that people can stay safe on the streets. Excellent, thank you everybody. We're gonna sneak in one last question here because we're doing pretty good for time. So we'll start with uh, Kathy answering this question and moving down this way towards me. Um, what will you do to foster equitable, sustainable growth of Seattle's education system, especially given the lack of classroom space currently? Yeah, repeat, repeat it one more time. Yes, please. What will you do to foster equitable, sustainable growth of Seattle's education system? especially given the lack of class classroom space currently. So I see this actually, Kathy Tuttle, uh, as, a, as a, uh, an issue, well, it's certainly an issue in District 4, but even more in other parts of the city. I've worked uh, for a long time with uh, Safe Routes to Schools, so I have seen the inequitable kinds of classrooms that are in city that are in neighborhoods all over Seattle and while I will be representing you uh, for District 4 I am very um, very upset about the kinds of, of, of infrastructure and the kind of education and the kinds of, of uh, uh, materials that are available in the other districts, particularly in District 2, that is the Rainier Valley, in Del Ridge, and in Lake City. I think that we need to actually provide really good uh, teaching and really good uh, quality education throughout the city. And that's the only way that we can actually grow a healthier city. Hi, Fred Kruger. I was lucky enough to volunteer for the Horn of Africa services down in Rainier Beach. This is a community, community group that helps children of refugee families in after school math and science programs and other programs like this. It was very rewarding. I had 13 year olds doing calculus. It's amazing what you can achieve with kids in small classroom sizes. The important thing to recognize here is that word equity. Equity does not mean equality. Equity means recognizing that we've made mistakes in the past, that we didn't give enough money to some people and gave perhaps a little too much to others. That means today we need to give up a little bit from our well-financed schools and divert that money to the less financed schools. Education is so important. We all know this, that we have economic barriers that prevent people from integrating throughout the city. I want to make sure all kids are given a good education so they can choose which neighborhood they want to live here. in here. Thank you. Sasha Anderson. I love this question because my first job out of undergrad at Seattle University was working with Head Start at Cooper Elementary. I also had the opportunity to work in Shoreline with special needs kiddos and currently I run a program through Big Brothers Big Sisters 
out of West Seattle High School that directly targets students who are at risk of not graduating. One of the things that I noticed when I was at school a couple of weeks ago is a student had put together a map of schools throughout Seattle and it had the word equity on it. And attached underneath that was a number. Under Chief South and Garfield, those, that number was zero. Here in Roosevelt, it was $3 million. That money comes from the PTSA. In our neighborhoods where parents are working two jobs to make ends meet, where they can't provide childcare, how are they gonna work to have extra money for their students? We need to have a partnership with the PTSA to distribute those funds citywide. I would also love to see more partnerships with Big Brothers Big Sisters to pair mentors with students of all ages, K through 12. Thank you. Joshua Newman. Uh, first, Seattle needs to continue to apply the race and equity toolkit that it's been using. Um, it has been used successfully in a number of instances recently. We need to expand that and continue to apply it where we, the decisions that the city is making looks at equity, not as an afterthought, but as an actual analytical process in determining what policies we should be following. Secondly, we can, as city council members, we can uh, pull the school, the Seattle Public School, Seattle Public School organization, together with the city planning departments. One of the reasons that there is overcrowding in schools is because there has been a long disconnect between SPS and the city, where the city says we're going to add density here, but SPS doesn't get the message until years later. We need to expand the safe routes to schools and improve the density and increase the density near our schools so that working families can walk to the schools and be able to know that their children are walking there safely as well. Sean Scott, so as a um, outreach coordinator with the city's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs, I was actually responsible for implementing um, the city's Race and Social, Ju Social Justice Initiative Toolkit uh, for the, transfer the transformation of King Street Station into an arts and culture hub. Also as somebody who has worked as a youth mentor in Seattle schools, I've seen the achievement gap um, up close. I think it's very difficult to have this conversation without pointing to revenue. As uh, I think it was Sasha had mentioned earlier, we, one of the reasons why we see such a big disparity in the endowments of schools uh, like Roosevelt versus those in the South End is because in the 1970s in the city, a giant abdication of responsibility where the city of Seattle said, we're just gonna fund all schools at the same level private fundraising steps in, and so a lot of that is exacerbated. A lot of those inequities are exacerbated. So I think we have to be looking at progressive revenue solutions that are gonna help us bridge that gap, and that are gonna help, it, help uh, schools that have less resources be able to compete and exist on a level playing field with those that have larger uh, private fundraising endowments. Emily Myers. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is acknowledge the fact that we have histor our, our zoning laws have historically had redlining and has excluded communities of color from coming in and, and buying, um, buying and owning property in a lot of our neighborhoods. And we still have some of those covenants that exist in current property titles. So acknowledging that and using that as a framework of how we move forward because right as as some of the other people up here have said like using pta funds to fill in the gaps in school funding is unacceptable so working with washington paramount duty and working with other community groups that are, are working at the state level to fund our schools is really important but making sure that our, our schools are open and accessible to all people so that everyone has access to a good education Heidi Stuber, as a former teacher and public school parent, I also agree wholeheartedly with Emily that the first step in equity is to make the state legislature fully fund our schools. It is, it is our paramount duty in this state. And the fact that our schools are not fully funded is impacting our most vulnerable students the most. I have a special ed student. He's been in eight school placements in eight years, not one of those changes by our choice. And so special ed students, English language learners, low income students, students of color, they have the worst outcomes in our district. And we need to elect a leader who knows about education to take good care of the promise levy money, which is supposed to help close the achievement gap. We need to use it to increase graduation rates for those vulnerable populations and also also, we need to look at lowering classroom size and making sure all students are included in every classroom. 
Alex Peterson. So education is the solution to so many problems in our society and you're already paying a lot in property taxes to support our public schools and when I worked for Tim Burgess we oversaw the families and education levy which is a major investment to help support our K through 12 system. I also helped to design the Seattle preschool program. We started it as a pilot program for three and four year olds, modeled it after best programs across the country. It's now a nationally acclaimed model and voters tripled it recently for three and four year olds. And that's serving 75% children of color. So we need to maximize these big investments we've made. And I, I look, if I'm elected, I will oversee the Families Ned levy to make sure we're maximizing those investments. We also need to look at expanding child care in <clears throat> street level retail spaces throughout the city. Thank you. Uh, I had the honor and privilege of attending Garfield High School, which is uh, one of the most diverse high schools in our city, state, and if not the country. And what I saw when in Garfield was uh, blatant racism in our schools. We had uh, AP classes where it was 99, sometimes 100% all white students. That's unacceptable. Uh, we need more diversity, not just in our schools, but in our classrooms. Uh, we need to be able to, as Heidi mentioned, uh, working to uh, close the achievement gap, and we need smaller class sizes. When we have smaller class sizes, students can interact with their uh, teachers, uh, and they get more one-on-one uh, -on -one attention, which, which is what kids need to learn. Uh, if we have class sizes that are 30, 35, 40 students, um, the teacher is never gonna have enough one-on-one uh, -on -one time in the day to see and meet the needs of each student individually, because each student in Seattle Public Schools has their own individual needs, and we need to have smaller class sizes so that teachers can support their students. Beth Mountseer. And I think it was stated at one point, in a, in a way, city council doesn't have a direct role in Seattle public schools. It's the school board that makes the decisions about. But that's not to say that the city council doesn't have a role in terms of what we were talking about. I think the question asked about classroom, planning for the future, this is a sort of relationship that should go on between city of Seattle and Seattle public schools in terms of thinking of the future and the kind of development and needs that we're gonna have for future classrooms. But what I wanted to mention that is an appropriate role, and it ties into what a lot of us have been saying about human services, we're in a crisis situation around homelessness, but the other place where it's important to make investments is upstream. I, in 2005, was one of the people who helped Bob Ferguson to develop the Veterans and Human Services Levy, which was the first countywide levy that also spent a lot of money on upstream investments in families to stabilize them. That's the way you help create a stable environment for kids to do well in school as well. Great, thank you. Home stretch, everybody, home stretch. So uh, we're gonna move into the lightning round. If everyone could just stand up, I think it'll be easier to see what your answers are. You all have uh, yes, no, yes, no cards. Um, I'm gonna ask, I think, eight questions, and you all answer at the same time, yes or no, and we'll hold it there for a little bit so everyone has a chance to um, see what your answers are. First question. That's the time keepers, there's 45 seconds. You, you don't, you, you, that's, that's I'll, I'll take care of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you support the continuation of encampment sweeps as they're currently carried out by the, na by the navigation team? Sweeps. Do you support the continuation of uh, encampment sweeps as they're currently being carried out by the navigation team, the homeless encampment sweeps? <coughs> okay, number two. Would you support additional taxes, such as an income tax or a head tax, to provide funding for, to address homelessness? <laughs> that was my fault, yes. <laughs> okay, number three. Would you support the development of municipal uh, broadband? Municipal broadband, municipal <coughs> internet. <laughs> What's that? Is that, is that maybe? He's an engineer, right? <laughs> okay, number four. Uh, did you support the addition of bike lanes to 35th Avenue Northeast? Did. Did. Still Let's see. Do you... <laughs> I should have clarified this. Do you support 
did you support the addition of bike lanes to, to 35th Avenue Northeast? There are not bike lanes on it now, protected bike lanes on 35th Avenue Northeast. <laughs> I know it's hard. These are all not, <laughs> yes, no is difficult. Do you support the ADU, uh, the, the tiny home kind of legislation that's currently under consideration with council? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do you support the ADU legislation that's, that's uh, currently under consideration with council? I can't see what, what Alex is doing there, but... That's a yes, that's a yes. We don't, there's no details allowed here. Would you support the expansion of the RPZ, the Restricted Parking Zone Program, and charging more for parking passes? Sure. Would you support the expansion of the RPZ program, the Restricted Parking uh, Zone program, and charging more for parking passes? Okay, number seven. Do you support allowing shared electric scooters in the city? They're fine. <laughs> okay, last one. Do you support congestion pricing in downtown Seattle? Congestion pricing. Great, okay, take a seat, thank you. We are really the home stretch here. We're just gonna move into the closing statements. We're a little bit past 8.30, so uh, this is gonna be just 45 seconds. Last, your last bits, your last shameless plugs for Roosevelt, Ravenna, and, 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 and uh, Maple Leaf. Um, let's start with, let's see, with Joshua and moving down that way. And this is 45 seconds, closing statement. All right. Joshua Newman, thanks again for coming out tonight. <sighs> Climate change is terrifying. And the number of people here and the change that Seattle is undergoing is terrifying. We're not going to be able to address either of those with Seattle Nice. We can't address it with the Seattle process. We don't have time. My children do not have time for us to wait around and keep building car tunnels. We need leaders who can address this and plan for the 21st century, not the 20th century. There are incredible candidates up here many of them with tons of experience and business expertise and analytical and truth-telling. Vote for one of us. <laughs> Yesterday I met with the police captain of the North Precinct and he shared his concern with me at how fractured he sees Seattle has become. Last week I was at a luncheon and President Obama's former Secretary of Homeland Security was the keynote speaker and he said this greatest single threat to our nation is divisiveness. I join this race because I firmly believe we all know we don't exist in silos in our districts. We're all connected. We need to work together to make sure Seattle is an affordable, inclusive, and climate conscious city, but we can't do it alone. And I hope to earn your vote this August 6th. Sasha Anderson, thank you. Hi, Frank Kruger. I'm a first time candidate, but you've heard a few big ideas from me. Uh, I wanna deprioritize single family zoning or even eliminate it altogether. I wanna dramatically increase the number of social workers to make a direct effect on the problems that we face. As an engineer, I'm accustomed to solving very difficult problems. As a business person, I'm accustomed to dealing with people coming to compromise in order to make progress. Elect me and I will work tirelessly to improve this city for you. If you have any questions about anything that I've said today, I'll be in the back uh, next to the blue shirts. And if you're just running off home, I hope you'll go to the website votefrank.org. Thank you very much. Kathy Tuttle, I hear you. You tell me you're being priced out of your houses by taxes. Uh, you tell me that you can't afford another rent increase. I've got 30 years of experience of listening to people, solving problems, building cities. I, as a resident, as a nonprofit director, and as, as a person who's worked for the city, 
I'm endorsed by people who have worked with me, who know my work. These are people who trust me. Council members Richard Conlon and Tom Rasmussen, the 46th District Democrats, Joanne Kerr, community leaders Inga Manskoff, Alan Derning, Heather Trim, Ed Lazowska, Arvia Morris, Jerry Large, Jim Matthew, and Laura Strauss. I encourage you to vote for me. I will serve you well. Thank you. Kathy Tuttle. I wanted to thank again the Maple Leaf neighborhood and Roosevelt neighborhood for hosting this this evening. Uh, and Ravenna. <laughs> that, oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to say I jumped into this race very late. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning when I introduced myself, I have 28 years of local government experience. I think we're going to have five, maybe seven new council members on the council in the coming year. I think experience, having been at the table, understanding that it is the details of policy, it's not just um, moving too fast, but I agree with Frank, we can't move too slowly either. Change is coming. People need to understand the sort of trade and policy trade-offs, and someone needs to be able to communicate that back out to the community. I'll look. Thank you. Um, the time is now to act on uh, environmental protection, uh, helping our homeless, uh, making sure that everyone in Seattle Public School uh, has equal opportunity, regardless of the color of your skin. And I plan on uh, tackling these issues head on when in city council. It's absolutely critical that we invest in public transportation, that we invest in affordable public housing for our homeless. And I'll leave you with this. While the other candidates tout their experience, if we've learned anything from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in New York, it's that your experience is as good as a bartender. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm Alex Peterson again, and I will listen. I will be a council member who is accountable. I've knocked on the doors of 14,000 voters in 20 different neighborhoods in our district. I've attended so many meetings of the Verena Bryant Community Association, the Ro Roosevelt Neighborhood Association, and I was just at the Maple Leaf Community Council meeting recently. I am the one who's gonna be out in the community listening to you. And we need a sensible, pragmatic approach again on our city council. Let's have a city government that we can be proud of. Thank you. So you asked us not to give an opinion about the other candidates, but I am going to do that, and it's because it's something I believe in. I think this is the best group of candidates in the entire city, and I mean that. I've met most of the candidates in the other district. We have a group of smart, passionate, and committed people. I'm running because I want to see this city change for the better. I agree that climate change is an emergency, but I also think we need changes right now in how we're taking care of our city and making it a safe place where people are taken care of. The Downtown Seattle Association rated me the highest in this group because they know I will be effective at creating the change we need in this city. I've been doing organizational change for over a dozen years, and I'm a single mom who knows what the issues are, and I want to see our city change for the better. Again, I'm Emily Myers, and you know, I decided to run for this seat because I got tired of politicians saying, well, I'm not a scientist, but, and then giving their opinion, right? We need scientific leadership at all levels of government, and that's why I decided to run, because I've been a scientist for 10 years, but in those 10 years, I've worked in science policy and founded organizations that advocate for scientifically informed policy at the state, at the, the um, federal level, and at the city level. So we need somebody who's going to use facts and data in order to get things done, but someone also that brings that, the working voice of people in our district to the council. And that's why I've been endorsed by thousands of workers across this city. And so I'm asking for your support. And please read more at emilyforseattle.com. All right, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Sean Scott, I think it's pretty clear that elections have consequences. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm proud to be endorsed by Carrie Moon in this race is because of the leadership that she showed in the 2017 general election with respect to making Seattle a more inclusive city, uh, with respect to making Seattle actually a climate leader, with respect to making Seattle actually an affordable city. 
Um, I was present at the founding some 15 odd years ago of the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project. I think that what's uh, in front of us in this election cycle is whether or not we want to be a city that moves forward, um, that moves with a lot of ambition and boldly into the future, or one that wants to retain um, a past that's slipping away from us and for good reason. So I would appreciate your support and thank you so much for making it here tonight. Let's thank all the candidates for joining us tonight. Thank you all for coming out. That's, that wraps up the, uh, the forum here. Um, thanks to Roosevelt High School for hosting us. Thanks to uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt Neighborhood Association, the Ravenna Bryant Community Association, and Maple Leaf Community Council for, for put, helping put this together. To all you neighbors for joining us. Um, everybody, please get engaged with your local neighborhood council. Uh, this is not easy to put on these events. These people actually listen to the community councils and want to know what we're thinking. It's a good conduit to get to get into uh, into the ears of candidates and council members. Get in touch with us, please. We need board members. <laughs> uh, election dates are coming up. We, uh, August sixth is the primary um, election date. The the ballots drop in a few weeks, I think. Um, yeah, and we. Roosevelt High School is open for another, we'll be open for another 15 or 20 minutes as we wrap up and clean up, so please visit everybody's um, tables and mingle with the candidates. And thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye.